Welcome to today's live stream. Uh, I see there's quite a few people here. Uh, underachieving Watch Collector, Reserve Commander, Craig G. Good to see you guys. John Liley is checking in. Howdy, John. Blue Shirt Buddha in the house. Chris of the Watch Lounge. It's awesome to see you guys. I hope you're having a good Sunday here. And before anybody says anything, yes, there is no Christmas tree in the corner anymore. I finally started <laughs> putting some decorations in the room. Uh, I will probably get one or two comments about that. But uh, yeah, it's, it's great to see you guys. I am excited about our guest today. I am joined by Armand Conde Sakira. I'm sorry if I butchered that. Um, Rosen, Armand, the watch guy, as, as uh, some of you may be familiar with, he runs the Watch Chronicler YouTube channel. He's got a blog. He's got a podcast. He's got some he's got some really great content and I'm looking forward to having a good discussion with him. We're going to be talking about watches, collecting, exit watches, being content in this hobby. And we would love to take questions. Uh Jerry is checking in. Hey Jerry, good to see you. And yes, Michael, Hardy Boys. I love the Hardy Boys. You can see them back here. Uh right back there. I've got the ones from like the 50s through the 70s, the older prints of the Hardy Boys. Um Anyways, yes. So I want to introduce our guest, Armand. Really grateful. He's coming in live from Oxford. Uh, he's, you know, six hours ahead of me here in Utah. So really gracious of him to take some time. And again, guys, if you have questions, comments that you'd like to discuss with Armand and myself, please put it in the chat and I'll, I'll do my best to keep an eye on the chat and, and post those up too. So without further ado, Welcome to Armand. Thank you for coming on the stream today. This is awesome to see you in, I guess you could say not in person, but I can see <laughs> your face. Well, as, as good as, as good as. Thank you very much for having me on. Uh, it's it's really fantastic. I've been watching a YouTube channel for quite some time, uh, and it's nice to be able to chat. Yeah, I know. You bet. Um, I'm, I'm impressed with your journey as well. I remember thinking, man, who is this Armand the Watch guy? <laughs> uh, he makes great videos. So um, yeah, it's, it's an honor to have you here. Uh, well, let's do. Um, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm no, sorry. I was just going to say it's it's much appreciated. I, I think that probably the um, uh, the view of me you had a few years ago was a bit of a funny one because I was still at school back then. So I was sort of doing this in my spare time um, and extremely lucky to get uh, the opportunities which it's it's brought me. So uh -huh. I'm extremely lucky. Yeah, awesome. Hey, there's a comment real quick from Michael. He wants to know about the modern tourbillon that you're interested in. You know okay. what he's talking about? I, spe I, I wonder if you might be talking about Arage and because I've been doing a partnership with them for, I think, over a year now, because uh, that's a brand which is it's an interesting one. They're doing a great job of, of creating their own tourbillon for a reasonable price. I mean, I'm not going to go into too many details here because you can find lots of content um, on my channel, but uh, it's a clever project. It's an interesting project, um, and that should be coming to the channel in physical form in the next few weeks, I hope. Um, so yeah, that's a completely bespoke tourbillon for, I think about 7,000, don't quote me, but I think, I think 7,000 is about the final price, um, francs. So fully Swiss made. Um, so that, that I'm looking forward to actually handling and showing. So th that actually sounds a little bit shocking because you hear about mm -hmm. tourbillons that are more affordable, but yeah. the row is from, you know, Southeast Asia. This sounds mm -hmm. like it's a Swiss tourbillon. Wow. I'm looking forward yeah. to that. That's going to be cool. Yeah, it's 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 a cool project, um, and the the engineers behind it, the people behind it. Once you, they're quite quiet, but once you get to to know them, you get involved. Um, I went to see their production facilities. Uh -huh. uh, it's really it's really amazing the stuff they're doing. I mean, most of the stuff I couldn't talk about at the time. Yeah. Um, but it's been nice to um, to really see that. Cool. You know, you've got a compliment here. Armand could be the voice of God. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I'm, I'm very flattered. I uh, certainly don't think that of my voice, but uh, but it's appreciated. <laughs> yeah. Oh, cool. So, hey, let's do a wrist check real quick, Armand. Yeah. Um, do you, I'm going to put your desk view I, up here. Yeah, I think that's probably best. So okay. uh, I've got what do you just want? a few pieces from my collection. I've got the new Deep Star on. Awesome. So the new uh, Deep Star on. I've been, I've been wearing this for a while. Um, because also partly because I'm getting used to it being my one dive watch because my Seamaster 300 is probably going to go off to be serviced in the next couple of weeks. Okay. Um, I've had it for five years now, I think, and it's been in the sea. It's been, you know, I've really beaten it up and uh, yeah, it's, it's in need of some, some care. So I'm, I'm getting used to wearing this as my sort of single sole dive watch and it's been great. 
Yeah. Um, and uh, it was cool uh, chatting with uh, Rick Murray about Murray about uh, the creation of it uh, a little while ago. And uh, yeah, I've, I've been enjoying the history of that one. So what are you that, Oh, so yeah, let me add my desk view here real quick. Um, I put on the Submariner. Ah. I've got the Hulk on today. Brilliant. Uh, such a beautiful watch. Mm. But, um, you know, I, I I found it really interesting because I for a long time, I thought that yeah. the Seiko 62 MAS diver yeah. from 1965 kind of came up with that interesting yeah. case. That's not the case. You know, uh, it, it actually mm. came from uh, Jean Richard, their, their Aquastar yeah. 60, which your watch that you're wearing yeah kind of has and so it's cool that you have that that you have that original design language on this modern chronograph mm. diver with history i think that's really neat yeah it's so. it's a cool it's it's a really cool project i mean clearly it's come from the docs uh, sort of experience of the the background of the brand so i uh -huh. guess it's not too surprising that it's pretty well engineered pretty well designed yeah. um for for what you'd expect from a proper dive watch and i think that it was a passion project for the for the the creator so uh, I'm I'm um, I'm impressed because I think this kind of watch can be difficult to, to make nowadays. I know Longines make their own skin yeah. diver uh, with uh, with waterproof, well, you know, water resistant pushes. But um, yeah, it's it's a it's a cool watch, and I've been enjoying it a lot. Yeah, and, and a lot of people don't know that Rick brought back Doxa. He brought back uh, Aqua Dive, and now yeah. Aqua Star. Yeah, at, in addition to straps too, I, I believe as well. Tropic. Yeah, in a funny way, I think that his straps might get an even bigger audience because you know you like a doxa or you don't like a doxa, but things like Tropic straps and Isofrain as well um, are kind of institutions of um, you know people who like dive watches and and want to wear a really nice rubber strap. Yeah, you know, I want to uh, I want to get to know you a little bit more, Armand. Sure. I mean, I'm I'm familiar with you. I'm sure a lot of the people here watching right now are familiar with your channel, but uh, here's some questions. What is your sure. favorite thing about creating content and what kind of content do you create? Because you do YouTube and then you have a podcast and you have a yeah. site. Kind of take us through that if you don't mind. Well, I think that I've come at watches from different angles over the years. Uh, originally, I just wanted to talk about watches on YouTube. I, I enjoyed it. I liked, the, uh, I liked the ability to create content with very little background knowledge in terms of technical knowledge, I mean, um, gotcha. of how to... You know, come up with a blog and at that time I didn't have much um, much in the way of experience for a blog or anything like that and uh -huh. more recently I've really enjoyed learning to properly photograph a watch that's the content I've enjoyed making the most because yeah. it's been a fantastic learning curve and a real joy to just sit there with uh, with some studio lighting and a camera and even even uh, even though I don't exactly use a professional camera I use an Olympus um, micro four thirds mirrorless and uh -huh. it's been it's been great, but it's been it's been a really enjoyable process to be able to capture uh, that sort of side of watches you can't really put your finger on that you only see under macro lenses, and so that's yeah. that's great fun. But the podcast has also given me a chance to just relax and talk about watches how I want to without having to think too much about structure because I script most of my videos. Gotcha. Yeah, and when it comes to professional level photography i mean your production yeah. level is right up there it's it's awesome that's really so, good it's really kind of you to say i don't really yeah, know what i'm doing see. but i give it a good go do you i know with a, a mirrorless camera sometimes yeah. there's different lens attachments kind of like with yeah. the the mirror game have you got into different types of of lenses yeah. or are you well, I, at the moment, I'm still experimenting because really there are three lenses I use. Um, uh -huh. I use a, a Olympus pancake lens for any kind of travel photography, just because I get a great deal of, uh, of options for that. For personal photos, I just use a fixed 45mm uh -huh. lens. And they're all Olympus lenses. I haven't really looked elsewhere because I found the quality to be really good. Yeah. Um, but then maybe that's an experience talking. And then I have a macro lens from um, Olympus, and I went for the sort of top end of what they offer without going into the pro um, gotcha. level of equipment and it's worked really well i get a lot of flexibility and once you've dealt with the lighting which i think is was the biggest learning curve for me mm -hmm. the steepest learning curve uh, i think you can you can get some really good shots and i think this is why really whatever you've got whatever equipment you've got you can get some really great pictures of watches yeah so tell me armand a little bit about your collection and your collecting philosophy yeah i'm, I'm interested to hear that Okay, well, my collections come together uh, in a mix of kind of luck and chaos. 
Um, but I'm trying to bring it together now. I'm trying to sort of realize, okay, I've got to be a bit mature about this. Um, and most of my watches have been funded by selling other ones. So it's been a kind of gradual escalation over the years. But really my philosophy with watches is to try to incorporate all of my interests where watches are concerned into a sort of set of watches that I know will make me smile because that's the, the kind of fundamental aspect for me uh, where watches are concerned. Uh, they make me smile. So I've got, I mean, I've, I can see that my, um, yeah, I pulled it up. Uh, my collection is, yeah, is, is visible. So I've got all the different sides of what I like. I like the sort of 90s design of the Seamaster over here. I've obviously got a bit of 60s on the wrist. But then the kind of then a few watches which were more sentimental to me, like this Speedmaster Mark III, I've saved for a fair while um, yeah. to have the ability to get that, and then um, bought it for my 18th birthday, um, and then and then started a great journey of trying to find parts to repair it, and because there were things that really weren't right with it, but it's all right now. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, the Grand Seiko was probably a big, big, big um, moment because they're just. It's, it's funny because you think, well, I'm going to save and I'm going to get a Rolex or I'm going to get a top level Omega. But I think making the leap of faith into something Japanese, but something very, well, expensive by comparison to the rest of my collection. Sure. Is I realize that obviously you can go way, way higher than that. But it was a, a big move and I've felt really rewarded by it. Oh, that's lovely, man. I, I got to say, you got into watches fairly young if you were saving for an Omega for your 18th birthday. Yeah. That is so cool to hear because, you know, I, I was late 20s before I really kind of got into traditional horology. Mm. And uh, so that, that's really nice to hear that you got the passion at a pretty young mm. age. Yeah. Yeah, it was. It was pretty early. I mean, I started my channel, I think, just after my 15th birthday. Um, and Back then, I'd, I'd saved um, to pay for half, I think, of an uh, Orient Ray uh, and uh, got the other half of the money for, for my birthday. Uh, and that was, that, was <laughs> cool. my, that, that was my first dive watch. And that was a great, uh, great way to, to get into sports watches. Because before that, I'd borrow, you know, I'd borrow my dad's watch, for example, and he was into dress watches mostly. Uh -huh. So uh, some, some of the less well-known older Tudors, uh, manual wind Omega he used to have. So some watches like that but uh, sports watches really have been the one thing which being on youtube has to have has taught me about or given the opportunity to learn about yeah you know we got a comment or a question from dave i think this is a good one mm. it says help me seamaster or pelagos i'm struggling to decide it's a really good question because that was exactly what i came up against when i picked up my seamaster um and for, from my perspective I, I i really like the pelagos i was going to save and get one i thought that's gonna be a great um great watch all round. titanium the bezel's amazing uh the bracelet's fantastic the movement's great but i put it on the wrist and i just didn't like it yeah. and that's something you can't really get ready for you see it in the window and you think wow that's amazing try it on couldn't wear it <laughs> that's got to be a little bit of a letdown um it was yeah it was a real letdown did that make you feel like you were settling i guess for a seamaster then like yeah this is my second choice not, not really, because I, the, the Seamaster was a, it was a sort of, it wasn't an impulse buy, but it was, it was not the thing I planned to buy that day because I bought it used um, for a decent price. I think they're actually worth more weirdly now than they were back when I got that, even yeah. in that generation. I mean, um, and I was going to get a an eighty five hundred caliber Planet Ocean. Yeah, I thought that would be a really great place to get into the Omega. Uh, world or ecosystem, I suppose. Sure. And I saw that, put it on the wrist and thought, mm, this is the better watch for me. Might not be the better watch altogether, but it's the better watch for me and I'm going to wear it more. So yeah, you, know, you can't, you can't really argue with that when you're spending your money. Not at all. I think sometimes we try to be very logical about watch mm -hmm. collecting and building the perfect collection. And I've fallen trap, you know, fallen in that trap yeah. many times, but I think the longer that I'm in the hobby, the more I agree with you that, that, you've got to connect with the watch. It's more of an emotional yeah. thing. And when you put it on, it can be totally different than in, in pictures and videos and mm -hmm. the research that you do before you purchase. Yeah. And so, um, yeah. And Dave, let me, let me give you my opinion here. Mm -hmm. And and also let me highlight Craig's real quick. Craig says that he thinks both the Seamaster and the Pelagos can coexist mm -hmm. in a collection. And I, I would agree with that for sure. Um, but it kind of it depends on what you're looking for. Like if you want one really nice watch that you can wear anywhere, anytime, not worry about it. 
I think the Seamaster is probably the better one. The Pelagos mm. is so austere yeah. to the point where it's almost brutal. And if you were wearing that every day, I think you would yearn for a little bit of polish and finesse and stainless steel from time to time. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say you can't go wrong really with either one, but just look at your needs. Like if you have a lovely Grand Seiko that you wear a lot and you just want something that's a great tool watch, mm. Lagos is awesome. <laughs> if yeah. you want something maybe in the middle ground that can pull respectable duty every day, but you can take it into the ocean, you can go <laughs> diving with it. I think the Seamaster might be the better one. Uh, mm. But that's just, that's my opinion there. That was a good question. And I missed one here from Tom who said, uh, this is for Armand, which Grand Seiko hmm. do you own? Is it the SBGW231? Mine is the SBGM221, uh, so it's the GMT. I was actually, I was actually really considering the, uh, the uh, SBGW231 because that's a, that's a lovely watch. I mean, it's like a Japanese Calatrava. I mean, it's just an amazing, yeah. amazing thing. Um, uh, if indeed I have the right reference, I think that's the 37 mil manual wind. And that's that's lovely, um, but ultimately I chose this one just because I don't have a I didn't have a straight normal GMT in my collection. So just I'll bring that up to the camera. I think that's yeah. So I, I didn't have a straight GMT in my collection. I have this Chrono Swiss, which is a Velju um, driven GMT, but it's it's not a true GMT. You know, you adjust the GMT after you've adjusted the normal time. So gotcha. Um, and uh, and I have a few manual wine vintage watches, and I thought well for daily wear. It's probably best to get the um, the GMT, particularly because whereas list there's a big price difference. Actually, when I came to buy it, I only paid I think 150 more for that than I would have for the manual wine. So, you know, it was a no brainer at the time. Yeah, Grand Seiko. I mean, they're one of the v the few brands that make a true GMT, and I yeah. I find that complication so handy. Uh, yeah, I would take that any day over a quick set date just be, to be able to bump the hour hand, the local hand. That's mm. uh, lovely. So Armand, let me go back to your collecting philosophy a little bit. Do you have yeah. a favorite watch in your collection and why, if you do, why is it your favorite? Well, th I, there's a lot of emotion behind a lot of the watches I, I own. Um, and you can see they range enormously in pricing. This Dan Henry, for example, is actually something which is a project watch for me. Um, I've had it since, since new and I've used it as a kind of a beta. And about eight months ago, I wasn't wearing it much. I knocked it hard uh, a few months before that and just hadn't picked it up. And I'm aging that. So um, I'm seeing what I can do to really give it a vintage look. Um, so that doesn't really count. But of all these watches, my Speedmaster means a lot to me because of the birthday kind of connection and, and also the amount I've invested to try and get it to work. <laughs> so, you know, inevitably you, you get, you get um, uh, attached to something. Also because I like the fact that it was a technological dead end. Um, it was kind of when Omega thought, well, let's try it. Well, with Lamania, maybe, um, let's yeah. try and make our own, let's try and make our Moonwatch movement into an automatic. And fo there followed a chaos of gears that I think is eight and a half mils thick, um, just the movement and you know, planetary gears and all sorts of chaos. Um, but I like the fact they tried to do it anyway. Yeah. You know, I reviewed the modern Mark II. Oh, yeah. And... and <laughs> That thing surprised me at how fun it was. Mm. I'm like, this doesn't yeah. even feel like a Speedmaster. This is all kinds of fun. Um, yeah. I have yet to see a, an original, or a, I guess you could say now a vintage Mark II. Yeah. They're, they're, they're a bit they're odd because when I saw the two of them, because I was originally going to get a Mark II, I saw the Mark II, and this is after having seen the remake, which at the time I really couldn't afford. I just couldn't justify the expense. Sure. Um, and also I sort of wanted something vintage, but um, I found that the original was, I felt as though I'd, I'd, I'd handled the wrong one first. I should have handled the vintage first and then the modern. Uh -huh. It just felt odd because it was like looking at a, it was just like looking at a worse version of the same watch. <laughs> yeah, and, that's, and that's bad. Yeah. Well, hey, there's a comment here that I want to highlight. I think it looks pretty yeah. good from Marco. Watch Chronicle needs a Breguet Type 20. Huh. I feel that would be perfect for him. I get him the 39.5 case with mm -hmm. a no date. What do you think about that uh, watch, Armand? That's a nice thought. I came close to, seeing, to buying one of those, and then I saw the service price. Um, and I was, I really, I, it was the same reason why I never went for his NFL Primero, because I really wanted to go for one of those, one of the rainbow ones from, uh -huh. I think, the late 90s. 
Uh, I love the kind of technical look of those. Yeah. But I was quoted 750 uh, pounds really? for a service. So I'm not sure what that is. Eight, nine hundred dollars. Yeah, probably um, nine. Yeah. Before lower. parts. Before parts. So, yeah. Before parts. So and that's that like sort a, of scared me off. That could be, I mean, if you found a great deal, that's almost the, a quarter of the price of a watch used, right? Yeah, I mean, if you consider the base caliber, then it's not inconceivable that that's more than the price of just replacing the movement. If you were if you were replacing the movement at um, um, industry price, I mean, you know, that's that's a lot of money to to put into a watch like that. And yeah, I, I just I just got cold feet before going for something like a Breguet Type Twenty. Now, I'd love to add a pilot's watch to my collection, like a nice pilot's chronograph, maybe a Zin One Hundred and Three. Sure. Uh, maybe one of the new manual handhards, uh, like, you know, really attractive watches. But for me, the Breguet for the time being is uh, is out of reach. Gotcha. Well, that kind of segues into the next question. What's yeah. the next purchase? And do you have, mm. quote unquote, a grail watch? Where do you want to go with yeah. your collection? Well, there have been a few sort of directions I've considered. Um, a few months ago, if you'd asked me that, I would have thought maybe I was going to sell a fair proportion of the watches in there and maybe get a Langer Saxonia. Yeah. Um, because I thought, oh, that would be a really great way to bring together the collection into uh -huh. one thing that I could just just really enjoy. Um, I very quickly realized that was a dreadful idea in terms of everyday wear uh, <laughs> and keep myself happy. Uh, particularly after I handled, at Christmas, I handled the uh, Richard Langer Jumping Seconds. And I looked at this £70,000 watch and thought, hmm, am I actually enjoying £70,000 worth of it? And I came to the conclusion, no, you know, it's a, it's diminishing return with that. Yeah. And, uh, I didn't, I wasn't feeling it, but in terms of the next purchase, I would like a pilot's chronograph. Okay. Um, that's, that is actually the direction I'm, I'm looking to go because for a long time, the Speedmaster scratched that, um, that particular itch and, uh, it doesn't anymore. It's more of a space watch for me. Um, it's yeah, it, it doesn't really fall into that category and, with my watches, I I do feel that I if I buy with my head, I don't tend to keep, but if I buy with my heart, they're watches which stick with me. So I have yeah. to find the right watch. I, I hear that. Hey, we're going to circle back to that consolidating yeah. and upgrading, I think, in a minute. Yeah. Uh, let's take a couple more questions. Tennessee Mike asks you, are you full-time with YouTube and the blog and the podcast? Yeah, so I am at the moment. Um, I am at the moment. I've been kind of figuring out what I want to do Um with uh, with all of the content because I've realised that as a sort of one man operation it's a heck of a lot to get um, to get get out the door so uh, it tends to be a case of trying to figure out which form of media is the best for for any piece of content but I am full time at the moment so um, so really it's things like sponsorship and um, all the revenue which I can get from different different elements of the um, the business which keeps the lights on so that's Definitely. great I don't know if that's going to carry on into the future. Um, I, I don't know. Perhaps it won't, but but it's been a great time to really explore watches and also understand what I want to do if I do do it part time. Um, and there's nothing like having the time to really consider how you want to keep up the content because there's no way I'm backing out of the watch world now. No, you can't now. <laughs> no, exactly. I'm stuck. I'm here forever. <laughs> yeah. Uh, on that note, guys, I want to shamelessly kind of plug Armand here. If you haven't checked out his channel or his blog or his podcast, I would encourage you to check it out. Subscribe. Help him out. I mean, this is this is his livelihood right now. He's full time, so let's Thanks. support. It's very kind of you. Yeah, no, let's do it. Let's help each other. This is awesome. Yeah. No, it's uh, well, you know, we all pull together if we're working in the the same the same field, the same area. You know, we all help each other with different opinions, different uh, different forms of content. It's that's what makes the current YouTube watch world so great. Yeah. Hey, let's let's hit another comment here from Dave. Can you guys mm. also talk about micro brands? Mm. So many. Is there brands to embrace or is it just buy what you like and not worry so much about the mechanics? Mm. What do you think, Interesting. Oman? Interesting. I think if we're looking at micro brands, there are some which spring out. Um, and also, it's sometimes difficult to tell where micro brands begin and end. Because I handled two uh, NTHs. Oh, N, I'm, I, I think the consensus is NTH, but... Uh, uh, handled those a few few uh, a, bit, a bit over a year ago and I was really impressed by what you can get for five or six hundred pounds um, and I think that embracing them is more difficult and it becomes more and more difficult the more you know about the people behind the brands because uh, I mean I don't I don't know what you hear I imagine we hear different things from different people but 
there's always a lot of whispering in the background of the watch industry about who did what to who and yeah um, and i do hear uh, those yeah who uses the good factories who doesn't who cuts exactly. corners blah blah yeah. blah. yeah it is and, and that's that's sometimes tough to separate from a really good watch yeah um i particularly i particularly one particular example um and i don't think i'm in much danger of offending him because i don't really know him um but one brand which uh i've sort of i'm, I'm unsure about is um time factors uh, because i have okay. a smith's some people will have seen i have a smith's there which is a fantastic watch for the price it's amazing uh -huh. um so it's this one just i'll bring it a bit closer um amazing sort of remake of uh, the watch worn by edmund hillary across antarctica not actually up everest but across antarctica um and i know that there's always been a bit of there have been some unpleasant stories around that brand and how they do business. Now, nothing I can personally attest to, but it's difficult to choose a watch when you're not sure if some things are true or false. Yeah. You um, know, I was listening to one of your recent videos and yeah. you were, I don't remember which micro brand or mm. which design you were referencing, but the phrase just struck me because I thought it was mm. hilarious. <laughs> you said it was cripplingly ugly. Oh yeah, I think, I, yeah. I think I was talking about um, some of Steinhardt's uh, non <laughs> homage work, and I yes. think a lot of people, a lot of people, got really offended. And I'm, I'm very sorry because I've owned Steinhardt's and I've liked yeah. them a lot. They're well made, yeah. um, but I think that when they go it alone with their dive watches, the designs kind of haven't moved on since about 2012 when they were launched, yeah. in my opinion. Sure. And I think that they could do with some work if they want to kind of move away from the from the homage image they have, because I think that. The Steinhardt um, OVM, so the Millsub, has become such a uh, almost a brand of its own that I think that if they ever want to move away from that, and I, I don't know if they do, but if if they did, I think they need to think carefully about how their designs are, how their own yeah. designs are. Sure. You know, to answer your question, Dave, from my perspective, um, I have a hard time connecting with some micro brands because I've. You know, my, I guess you could say my collecting philosophy over the years has changed and I'm no longer interested or impressed by homage watches, even mm. if they do carry, you know, crazy amounts of value. Yeah. Um, I, that's a personal thing. I know not everyone will agree with me and that's okay. So I know a lot of micro brands, uh, some brands just make their living by doing homages of Omegas and Rolexes and Longines. And whatnot. So for me to be really invested or interested, mm -hmm. that micro brand has to have an original design. And mm -hmm. it's hard to come up with something original that is not just out there or maybe cripplingly ugly. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I'm, I'm starting to regret that actually. <laughs> All right. Oh, no, you shouldn't, man. I, I, I like that. I thought that was good because um, it emphasizes how difficult it is to come up with something that's different but powerful mm -hmm. and has substance to it. Yeah. And um, let's say Ming, I've yet to see mm. a Ming in person, but that is a micro yeah. brand. I guess maybe they're an independent brand. I, again, like Armand said, it's hard to see the line sometimes. Yeah. But when, when a brand can come out with something original that really works and resonates with the watch enthusiast community, I mean, uh, they sell out quickly now. And I, I can see the reasons why. So for myself, yeah, you can embrace micro brands, but I, I think it, it's hard for me to do it these days. It, it mm. has to be a really special watch for me to really get excited about it, I guess, because mm. I do think there's good value to be had for micro brands, for mainstream brands, mid-level brands, luxury brands. It just pl it depends on how much emphasis you place in various aspects of a watch, if, if that makes sense. So kind of a long mm. answer to your question, Dave, but... Hopefully. It's interesting you. It's interesting you mentioned Ming. I'll just interject because uh, yeah. before, before we move on, um, I, when, when I came across those, and I've only handled one once, so I, you know, I add that um, proviso. It was at a some sort of watch meeting. I can't remember exactly, but it was a journalist who happened to have happened to be working with them and took them out of his pocket. Um, and uh, I feel like a fool now. That was three or four years ago. I should have bought it off his wrist, um, yeah. you know, given how hard they are to get hold of now. And it was it was a nice GMT. Yeah. Um, I feel like a fool. <laughs> gotcha. Oh, sorry. One more thing about the micro brands. Um, I've noticed in all brands, doesn't matter if it's luxury, doesn't matter if it's a uh, high horology, affordable, mid-level, all brands will have quality control issues from time to time. Mm -hmm. But I've, I've just noticed a higher level 
of issues that, that happen with micro brands. And I've stopped taking prototypes. Like if you want, you want me to review your watch on my channel. I mean, first off, I've, I've got to be interested in the design. It's got to be original now. Uh, I mean, I have some criteria, so I don't do a whole lot anymore, mm. but I don't do prototypes anymore because I mean, so much crap in the dial and <laughs> you name it. I've seen issues uh, and it seems to happen on a higher level with micro brands than with mainstream mm. brands. Um, take mm. that for what you will. I, I don't want to come across as too negative, but Dave, Dave appreciates, appreciates the, the, um, mm. the responses here. And yes, Dave, you you did miss what we were wearing. Uh, I'm wearing the sub. Let me pull it up here. Yeah, I'm wearing the sub, and we'll do one more wrist check here for our model. Yeah, I'll, yeah. So I'm wearing my Aquastar Deep Star. So yeah, yeah I bought, bought this late last year and been enjoying it since. Awesome. Mm. Kevin says, "I think Ming are a bit overhyped." Hmm. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, when something sells mm. out in a number of hours. Isn't the hype real about it, though? You mm. know, I don't know. It's, it's, it's a tough one, isn't it? Because with watches, so much is not really down to physical value. It's down to how much we like them. So I suppose if the, if the, uh, the buyers are there to, to, to get the product, and the quality is definitely good, I can say that. The quality yeah. is good. You might not like the product, but the quality is good. Uh, then, you know, you buy what you like, and if a lot of people like it too, you're, oh, you're in a difficult position. Hey, you know, I want to go back to what you were saying earlier about how you toyed with the idea of selling a majority of your collection and getting yeah. a Longa. Because I I kind of did that. I sold the majority of yeah. my collection yeah. and I got an overseas. And this is exactly. the pinnacle of my my watch collection now. And I That's love it. Watch. So I, I kind of ended up doing something similar to what you were toying with. Hmm. And... Uh, Let's see. Let me take this off and put a banner up here. Is an exit watch a myth? Because mm. I think some of us, we think, hey, uh, I could sell this, this, and this. I could get that solid gold president, or I could mm. get that Breguet. I could get, you know, a Longa or a Vacheron Paddock, mm. whatever it is, and I can be content. And so, do you, I don't know, Armand, what do you think? Is the exit watch possible? Or... <sighs> Mm. Is it not lasting? I'm interested to hear your mm. opinion here. I'm sure it's possible. I'm sure there are some people who could find a watch which they could pick up and wear for the rest of rest of their life, essentially. But I think that something people don't take into account is that if you if you enjoy the watch community, you enjoy the uh, well the, the the discussion which goes on around watches. It's almost inevitable that at some point you're going to fancy something new and and you might be tempted to, to add it to the collection, at which point does that diminish the exit watch you bought because ultimately it wasn't enough? I, I don't know. For me, it's more important at this point to choose watches which I'm not going to want to sell again, so which I can okay. hand I don't know, hand down to my children or you know, they can give to their children or something um, after I've put some dings on them over the next 50 years. Um, so that's really the ide ideal for me. I'd like uh -huh. to get watches which I can really bond with and just keep indefinitely. But real quick, just Armand, one doesn't matter. Real quick, you mentioned children. Are you a father right now? No, no, I'm not. I'm I'm 20, and uh, you've I'm got plenty of time. Any position, not in any position yet to uh, to have any child. I do intend to eventually, but yeah. Um, but <laughs> but at this point, no. Uh, okay, I was just curious. Yeah, no, you yeah. got plenty of time, man. Yeah, yeah, cool. <laughs> And here's a couple comments. Mm. Um, Michael says, "I think it has to do with one's age." Mm. So maybe I don't know. Interesting. When, when you get older, maybe an exit watch is more realistic. Like mm. you've point. played so much in the hobby that now you're okay. You're, you're content to get out of the hobby. Yeah. Yeah. Dirk, mm. hey, good to see you, Dirk. He says you would be content for a while. <laughs> yeah, that yeah. point. I, I think I think Dirk, you got a point here. Um, I think the exit watch for me is a myth and mm. to the point where I don't have keepers like this, uh, overseas in front of the yeah. camera and uh, the Samaritan that I'm wearing today, I'm not going to try to fool myself and say, Hey, this, this is my exit watch. This is going to stay in the collection forever. I'm going to hand this down to my daughters. Cause I've learned for myself, uh, no, all watches are temporary mm. and, um, I enjoy just playing with whatever I'm interested in at the moment. I guess you could say that is an irresponsible kind of winding way, meandering way of 
enjoying the hobby, but it's, it's something that I've just really found, uh, works for me. And so mm. for, for myself, I don't think I'm going to have an exit watch, but I do have things that I would like to try. Like I would love a long one day. I would love a long one day. I would love to try full precious metal piece from Rolex one day. Um, yeah, you know, but <laughs> we'll just see where, where it takes us, where it goes. Mm. Um, but it's, but it's interesting. It's interesting. You, you bring that up about the idea of trying something because I've uh -huh. never owned a Rolex. I've owned Tudors, but I haven't owned a Rolex and I've come close. I've thought about it, but I just don't feel it's the right moment yet. Yeah. And, uh, there's nothing in their current collection that, well, a, I can get hold of, uh, sure. and B that I particularly, particularly want. I mean, I'd, I'd love to get a Cellini moon phase. Um, but I also recognize the well, the pretty catastrophic decision that can be uh, if you you know if you if you buy it new and you and you're not prepared to to just just own it and not yeah. not worry about it because you don't see many on the used market just because it seems like no one is brave enough to buy one in the first place. Yeah, I went into my authorized dealer this week. I had I had lunch yeah. with uh, with a friend that works there, mm -hmm. and they almost only had Cellinis. Like there were a few wow. ladies pieces. There was like a Datejust 36, uh, a couple presidents with stones, and then like four Cellinis. So, um, mm. I mean, they, they have them. They, they have yeah. them in the authorized dealer and just about nothing else, at least my place mm. here in, in Utah. Uh, interesting. Tom says, he's right about Longa. I start wondering, <laughs> do I really need both kidneys? Mm. <laughs> yes, you do. You do need both <laughs> kidneys, Tom. Uh, you do. But the, mm. Yeah, I know. I, I would love one one day. I've... I visited um, when I was in Las Vegas, actually purchasing yeah. this overseas. Mm. Um, the the place that that had this, there was actually it was all in a row. There were different boutiques, and they were all owned by the same company. And mm. there were doors in between each one, so you could go from mm. Vacheron to IWC to Cartier. And there was a small uh, Longa section mm. uh, that you could sit in, kind of this private area. Yeah. And we, we looked at a few watches and mesmerizingly beautiful. Uh, the detail work was <laughs> next level. So I would mm. love, yeah, I would love to see a long of one day in the collection. Mm. I, I think that'd be great. So, yeah, they do, they do make amazing watches, but one thing with that brand is that I think it's very easy to spoil yourself. Um, if you look at one of the, like a Handwerkskunst, um, top of the level, model before you look at just a simple three hand because i made that mistake really? um and it kind of it kind of made it difficult um because i found that i was looking for more even though what i was presented with was already marvelous <laughs> oh hey i just noticed this comment i want to highlight it mm. are you really collecting watches or watch experiences mm. i love that i i collect watch experiences no doubt i don't yeah. collect watches that's a great yeah. way of, of stating that Mm. I'd have to agree with you. I'd have to agree with you that. Uh, I think I'd be kidding myself if I told myself I was actually collecting watches. <laughs> hey, here's another one. Is lasting watch contentment possible mm. in, in collecting watches? I know it kind of ties mm. in with what we've talked about earlier. Mm. Does the contentment, is it, does it last? Like can, or you always have to hunt for the next watch and then you're, you're content again, but I don't know. What, what do you think about this, Armand? It's, you know, it's, it's a tough one because I think it's a more general question than the ones we've talked about, which are, which are a bit more pointed and kind of went to a direct um, answer. Uh -huh. But I think, I think with watches, the, just the metal, so to speak, isn't necessarily enough. I think you have to associate memories with them, uh, an important um, uh, point in your life or a really enjoyable experience, for, for me at least. Um, like, for example, my, my Seamaster, I wouldn't consider ever selling just because... Well, or at least these days, I don't, I don't ever consider selling and I don't think I will in future uh -huh. because it's been on my wrist. It's been the watch I've reached for when I just needed to grab a watch because I had to, there was something of importance. I had to travel. I had to, um, I was going on holiday. It was just always the watch I'd pick up because it's the same as a large number of other watches. So I'm not too, not too worried like I would be, say, with a Submariner uh, or something like that yeah. about taking it to slightly less ideal places. Uh, it's tough. It's good looking. It's versatile. And because I associate all those memories with it, I don't think I'd want to part with it. Yeah. I, I think uh, here's a thought that, that came to me when it comes to watch contentment. I don't know that it's necessarily lasting. 
even as as Tom says, saying, I don't know if I had an 1815 in rose gold, mm. I could just sit there and be happy <laughs> on dialysis. Um, <laughs> I think what's more important is just having no preconceived notions. Like if you go into a watch, you know, a watch boutique or you go to a watch meetup and you, you take a look at a piece that maybe you've only seen pictures of and you thought, now nah, that, that would never really be the watch for me. And mm. then maybe you put that oyster quartz on and you go, yeah, yeah, this, this works <laughs> really well. As long as you have that open mind and mm. um, you're not being pigeonholed into what you think is acceptable or logical, then I think you will have a more enjoyable time in the hobby. Mm. And maybe that, that, maybe that relates to contentment. Maybe you, as long as you have an open mind and you're enjoying what you love, you're making those, those, uh, emotional connections, experiences with watches in the long run. I think you could look back at your time collecting watches. And even if you didn't have necessarily keepers, you could say, I was content. I had a great journey and I'm glad that I did it. Hmm. So I don't know. That, that's my, that's my answer there hmm. about, about that. Hmm. Uh, let's go to another question here. Guys, if you have any specific questions for Armand, please put them in the comments here. We'd love to interact with you guys some more. Sorry about that. I forgot to plug in my laptop. Oh, you're fine. No, Just no worries a second. Here. Yeah, uh, uh, no, there no we worries go. at all. That's better. There okay, let's go to favorite watches. Let's talk about... Mm. Um, let's talk about a few things. Armand, what makes one a lovely or a powerful watch design mm. and conversely what makes a poor or an ugly a terrible watch design mm. let, let's start explore this idea here i think i think that well for me at least and this is obviously personal because whoever looks to watch will see beauty or, or just a really hideous look based upon their their own notions of, of what they like but for me there's a difference between good looking and important or powerful Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of watches, I think, which are objectively ugly, like the Seiko Tuna, which I still think are fantastic looking because they just do what they 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 have so much function, so much purpose in that design that yeah. it justifies the look. Um, sure. I, I, I don't know if I could wear one just because well, I think with a big one, one of the large thousand meter ones, I just worry about um, uh, chipping it or taking the coating off um, a bit too much. And uh, you know, that would that would put me off. But anyway, um, that's beside the point. But I think that a watch not being derivative is really important to me. I think a watch needs to stand for something on its own. That's why I don't think I could ever have, well, not necessarily not have an homage, but I couldn't have uh, an homage to a watch which actually is still in production yeah. in, my, in my collection. That's a good point. Um, yeah, because I don't, I don't mind um, an homage. And this is a funny one. This is a, a Bois Mercier from, uh, I think, 1973. I can't be sure, but I think it's 1973. Um, if there are any experts, and it's got that Buren micro rotor movement in it. Um, oh, that's lovely. Which is which is which is cool. And this is a you know, it's a gold piece. That they're not particularly rare or valuable, um, but clearly it's had a, had some date just influence. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's I mean it's twenty years after the date just, and uh, well, more bit well almost almost thirty years after the date just, uh, and clearly it's got some date just in it. But it sort of justified itself with its age. Um, it worked in its time, and so it works for me today. Um, so. That for me is a is 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 not derivative, um, yeah. but but yeah no derivative is uh, a watch being derivative is for me the biggest problem with it with its design, because good looking or ugly is just opinion. It, well, and, and also I think there's a distinction between derivative and a straight up copy. Like the dimensions sure. are so nominally close, like it's like yeah. come on guys, come on yeah. now. Yeah. Uh, no, is that watch, is that capped gold? What is that? Or is that that's, no, that's, that's full precious. So hang on. I'll, I'll, I'll take wow. it off the, the, um, I'll take it off the, um, uh, the, the little cushion. Um, and it's got one of these, I'm not sure if how visible that is. I don't know how the focal the focus on this is, but it's got an internal Cyclops. So it's where they've cut it out of the inside of the crystal here. Let me maximize that real quick. There Let's we see go. What we can do. Yeah. So it's, it's got a, a Cyclops cut out of the inside of the crystal. Oh, so it's lovely. actually it's actually a flat acrylic on the top. If I can just get it to to focus, um, it's a flat acrylic, and mm. yeah, it's it's eighteen karat gold, but it's it's tiny. It's I think thirty four and a half mils, so it's a uh, you know it's a little watch, uh -huh. and it's got none none of the watch resistance of a of a date just, but uh, but it's got that look, and uh, well, I like it for it. And you've got it on. A, is that a stingray I saw? That is a stingray. 
Yeah, it's a sort of handmade Stingray, which I got hold of a while back. It was actually in a review, and since it was made for me, they didn't want it back. So I ended up just adding it to the collection, which, um, you know, and it's worked, it's worked quite well on this because it's an 18 mil, um, sorry, 19 mil lug width, and I haven't got any, any other strap to match it. So gotcha. you, know, you, have to, you, you use what you can fit on the watch. You know, here's a here's a a good question for Marco. He says, "I don't know. I got to tell you, I have contemplated the Gevril Tribeca once or mm. twice. So, but that might yeah. go go down to can you get a Paul Newman? I mean, is yeah, it's may, maybe it's not even a watch anymore. It's too much. It's too much of a collector's or museum piece to even qualify as a watch anymore. I mean, you know, six two six three is impossible to get hold of for anyone with reasonable needs." I've seen a couple of those in person, uh, mm. and they're they're cool. But uh, for myself, I'm more interested in some. Mm. I'd be more interested in the in the Black Bay Steel and Gold Chrono. Honestly, yeah. it has some of those. You know, uh, what is it? The '64. I can't remember the reference of yeah the actual Rolex. I'd probably be more interested in that than than almost the one to one of the the Gevro. Am I even saying that correctly? I'm not sure. Mm. But, um, but you know what's funny? You know what's funny about that? Um, I, I think it's Gevril. I, I, again, I'm, I'm not sure either, but I think it's Gevril. Um, is that uh, I saw one for sale at Sotheby's, and I think it went for five thousand dollars. Oh my goodness! Yeah, that's. I was amazed by that because I thought they were still in the fifteen hundred pound know, yeah. kind of ballpark watches, like like the Steinhardt equivalent, actually. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, they they return. Um, but no, they're, they're selling for a lot. Although I do wonder whether it's because of publicity and because of a lot of articles about them questioning whether or not they're a good buy. And also, I think they were they appeared on on Talking Watches, didn't they, at some point? I think they did. I think yeah. they did. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. Here's one from Wilson. He's asking you, how did you become so taken, <laughs> taken and proficient with watches at a relatively young age? Hmm. Well, I mean, I, I'm flattered that uh, I'm viewed as proficient, but... But uh, it mostly just reading everything I could get my hands on. Um, anything I could get hold of, I'd read because it very quickly became apparent that I knew nothing about watches uh, at the beginning of all of this and that I really needed to put that right. And I've made a lot of mistakes over the years, but uh, I like to try and avoid them moving forward. Uh huh. Uh, let's take a couple more questions here. Oh, John says that he has one mm. i don't think i've seen yours john john's local to me here we mm. we get together every once in a while uh I don't, yeah next time we go have wings or something you should bring it or maybe yeah, you, you, you just tell us what you think yeah <laughs> um let's oh here's one from engineer wannabe mm. what about the grand seiko sbgn 003 it looks a lot like the explorer mm. 2 but it has its own redeeming characteristics mm. do you think that's a derivative watch armand that's really interesting, and it's it's a tough one because I really respect the movement. I respect the technology there, um, and I know a few people have bought them and have been really impressed with them. I, I'm, I mean, I have no doubt in Grand Seiko quality. Uh, they always seem to deliver. Recently, I found that some of their mid-level offerings, uh, like the new King Seiko, was a bit of a weird priced piece, but uh, that's yeah. irrelevant. But speaking about that 9F GMT, it's, it's a great watch, I'm sure. Uh, I haven't handled one, but I'm sure it's a great watch if it fits you, because I know sizing and proportions. But uh, I don't think it's derivative in the sense that you you wouldn't you wouldn't mistake it for an Explorer. Sure, it, it's taken the same format, but then so many watches have taken the Submariner's format. I, I mean, in that regard, yeah. the Blancpain 50 Fathoms was unsuccessful in the sense that it's the Submariner which is replicated. So maybe that's the same thing with with that, that the Explorer 2 is just such a good design for what it does. It makes sense for the Grand Seiko to look like that. Yeah. You know, I reviewed one of those uh, mm. maybe a year or two ago. Yeah. And I said, you know what? This is eerily similar to the Explorer 2. I mean, because yeah. at least the bezel, yeah. not the dial, sure. but at least the bezel, you can definitely see it. And I probably had like five people say, no, you're just a Rolex fanboy. You know, this <laughs> is actually, it's actually, what was it? The, uh, uh, the watch that the brand that Invicta just bought in the past few Ooh. years, uh, what was it? The I'm blanking name. the name. You know, it's the GMT that has. I'm trying to think. I can't believe I'm forgetting the name. And it was like, oh, now they're they're trying to obviously pay a tribute to that one. That was the original mm. one in the 1950s that had that type mm. of look in the bezel. Yeah. 
And so I think there is definitely cross language between watches. And then there are some watches that might not be the first to have a particular oh, yeah. look, but now we just associate that look with that brand. Like no one's going to, I'll have to look at that. It's going to buy. I see. I see the deluge of glycine. In glycine. The that's yeah. Of course it's the M and isn't it? Thank you guys. Yeah. Yes. The glycine. That's yeah. what I was talking about. It's a good point. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, you guys are awesome. Thanks for, for covering me there. Um, Cover but us like, both. yeah, uh, the, the seat, the speed master, excuse me, the speed master, you look at the dial, uh, that wasn't, um, that wasn't an Omega product really. I mean, mm. the, the design came originally from a watch from the brand, uh, Rodania. Mm. <laughs> Nobody knows about that though. Everyone yeah. associates the the uh, the two little dots, the the markers, the way the dial is laid out. Everyone associates that with with Omega. So I think sometimes a brand takes a look, even if they're not the first, and they make it their own. And I think Rolex has done that with that Explorer Two dial. And I think the Grand Seiko is probably different enough to where it, it does have redeeming characteristics, like Engineer Wannabe says, but. Um, I, I do think it is fairly derivative of a more iconic look from another brand, if that makes sense. So yeah, Lester's happy with the Rodania <laughs> shout out. Go Belgium. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> okay, guys. Um, let's, let's answer some questions. Do you have anything else to say, Armand, about favorite watches? I, I kind of interrupted you there. See, a favorite watch, you know, it's a really tough one because whenever you tell someone who isn't into watches, you're into watches, they ask you, what's your favorite watch? And then I'm, I have nothing to say because I would have to go into a 15 minute speech about different things. Yeah. Um, and I, I'm sure, you know, it's very difficult to kind of moderate what you're saying uh, without either sounding boring. Well, you're always going to sound boring, really. Always. Know, some people. Uh, uh, there's no, there's no getting around it. Um, yeah. Uh, here, let me pull up this banner real quick. Uh, guys, if you have a question or a comment, please put it in the chat. And while you're mm -hmm. typing those out, I have kind of a funny story. Um, yeah. there was a, a small film that was made. I live in Utah and there's a lot of people, uh, that are Mormons or, or Latter-day Saints here in Utah. Mm -hmm. And I watched this film. It was called the fighting preacher. And one of the actors is local here mm -hmm. and he came to a screening and I, I met him after the screening, after, after we watched this movie and someone had told him, like, hey, this is the watch guy. If Bruce, this is the guy I was telling you. Come meet this watch guy, Bruce. So I talked to him a little bit, and he's like, hmm. "What? you're into watches, so what's your favorite watch? What's your hmm. favorite brand? And like you said, I was like, man, I, how, am I, how am I supposed to answer this? So <laughs> I actually went with – I lied, really. I hmm. went with brands that I like that I thought he would be more familiar with. Hmm. So I didn't say – you know, Vacheron Constantin. Yeah. Um, I, I said Rolex. I like Rolex. I like IWC. I like Grand Seiko. And even then, when I when I thought I was mentioning brands that he might have heard of, mm. I don't think he he was really familiar with it. So mm. uh, that's just kind of funny that 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 you mentioned mm. uh, how to interact with those types of non watch yeah. enthusiast questions. Yeah, so, no, it's it's it, it can be it can be really sort of odd. It can leave you in a feeling in a, a really odd position. Yeah. All right. So we've got a few we've got a few comments here. Let's do one from James. Any impulse buys, regretful or otherwise? Have you made impulse Ooh. purchases, Armand? I have and I haven't. I'll tell you a story. Um, when I bought my first Tudor, which was a Heritage Ranger. I went in to the dealer to buy a Black Bay 36. I was sold on the idea. I was going to get it. And I went in and um, they didn't end up having a particular model. I can't remember. I think I wanted the bracelet and they only had the strap version. And, um, there was some confusion there. And I saw the Heritage Ranger and I liked it a lot and I bought it. Um, but I bought it after leaving the shop and I was actually on the train back home when I made the decision and just gave them a call and said, could you bring it? And because of the weird um, policies that the Hans Wilsdorf Foundation have, they couldn't send it to me. So the guy had to drive an hour and a half to bring it to me. Wow. And it was picked up. There was a family member, someone else at home who, um, who received it for me. And I then read, proceeded to discover that the watch that I'd looked at in the shop, I just I hadn't inspected properly hadn't inspected it properly. Um, I should have thought it through. I'd inspected the Black Bay to make sure there was nothing wrong with it, no scuffs, no damage. 
Yeah. And I look at this Tudor, this Heritage Ranger, put it on the wrist. I go, wow, that's fantastic. And then I notice there's a chunk taken out of the crystal. Um, chip in the side of the crystal and then scratches down the side of the case. Now, that, that sort of concerned me, as you can imagine, having just bought it full list price. Oh, um, yeah, that, that's having, unacceptable. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I know there have been other sort of problems with Tudors. Luckily, the crystal wasn't so much of a problem. When I really inspected it carefully, it was a very, very minor um, imperfection. It was just that you know, the, sometimes under harsh light, it can look bad, but there were scratches down the side of it. I was lucky. Um, the dealer saved me, in essence. They gave me a discount sufficient to make the purchase equivalent to a used piece. Gotcha. But, you know, that's a moment when I really should have been careful. It was a lot of money, uh, particularly at the time. It still is a lot of money, but it's it was a big purchase for me at the time and sure. uh, should have been careful there. Um, yeah. There is one comment which I, I see coming up, which is let's the pronunciation of JLC. Oh, let's do it. Which is, which is an interesting one because I can't give an answer about this. The correct Swiss German pronunciation of JLC? Yeah. Mm. Well, if it's, have, if it's German, it would be Jaeger, right? Well, yeah. But that's not, everyone uses the French pronunciation. Yeah, right? which, which is weird because I, I remember I had a conversation with, um, with James Dowling, um, the, the watch dealer, and he was doing a lecture in London. And uh, I remember someone asking him uh, what he thought, and he gave a very good answer, which was that in front of the, Swi the French Swiss uh, people, indeed, I suppose that's that's the key background of the brand nowadays. It's Gigi Le Coudre. Um, but in reality, really, we should all we should all actually be pronouncing it Jaeger. And so every time I say Gigi Le Coudre, I am sort of technically wrong. I mean, the guy was Swiss German or certainly of German descent, and it would have sure. been Jaeger, you know, hunter, background of the word hunter. So uh, it's it's one of those odd points where etymology disagrees with the company. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? I've actually... Here, let me uh, let me try to point to it. I've got this hmm. Atmos clock here. Oh yeah, from the yeah, 50s. At the beginning. Yeah, so yeah. I actually got that I, about a week and a half ago locally, it's fantastic. and it is pre JLC. It's just hmm. Lucutra, and hmm. I'm probably even saying that wrong. But I mean, it, it's cool. I, I'll have to. We'll I'll do a video on that sometime. Hmm. But um, yeah, I mean, there were two. There were basically two different um, entities that came together hmm. at one point, and so. I mean, how are you supposed to properly pronounce it? I would mm -hmm. say pr more like the French than with the German, even though yeah. Jaeger is, is definitely the way you would say. Yeah, no, that. but also their, their branding's been odd for quite some time because I think, I, don't quote me on this, but I think um, I read that they tended to use different versions of the names for different markets. Because okay. I know, as you say, it's, it, you, that would just be a Le Coudre on, on the dial. Uh -huh. Because they did, they didn't tend to put Jaeger on American watches. I think there was some tax reason for case. I think the cases were made in the U.S. for those watches. Interesting. I think this was in the fifties or the sixties, just because there had to be a certain proportion of them made. So I think their gold cases were U.S. made, huh. um, and they branded them differently. So it's it's one of those odd sort of background aspects, um, which I suppose they've moved away now that everything is sort of standardized. Yeah. Here, here's another pronunciation mm. question. How do you properly pronounce this brand? I want to hear wow. you say it, Armand. <laughs> well, I, I would say Vacheron Constantin. Um, uh -huh. That's the sort of pronunciation. Although my, because I am, technically I'm a Swiss citizen um, really? because of family there, but uh, my pronunciation is more French French because I lived there. So, gotcha. um, so you probably have to ask someone who lives in Switzerland. They tend to speak slowly and with a stronger, a uh, sort of stronger um, accent. Uh-huh. You know, there's a guy in here, Kyle, uh, who, who speaks French, and he was he was trying to tell me how to properly say it because you know I've obviously I've, I've got one now, yeah, <laughs> right here. And he said uh, it, to to say it like a native, you can actually drop an extra syllable from uh, from Vacheron. You just mm. go Vacheron instead of Vacheron. I see what you mean. Yeah, it's quite good. So, anyways, yeah. Yeah, you've got great pronunciation. I, I, I appreciate <laughs> that. That's that's awesome to hear. Well, I'm, I'm flattered. <laughs> let, why don't we stick with pronunciation, guys? Sure. How do you how do you properly pronounce this brand? Ooh. How, how would you go, how, how would you approach Omega? it? Well, I'm I'm a I'm a heathen here in the Western mm. United States, so I say Omega instead mm. of Omega. But 
I don't know what what is the right way to say. It. How do you say it, Armand? Well, I I I'm told by everyone I get it wrong, but I've always known them as just Omega. So I okay. put the emphasis at the beginning. Um, but I, I I don't know. I really I don't know what the correct pronunciation. I mean, in French it would be Omega. So, but I I, I you know I think it's just one of those words. I mean, it's not exactly a an English or a French word anyway. So, no. I suppose you have to ask a Greek person. Uh -huh. Uh, it, John's asked this a couple a couple times. Where did you learn your French? Oh well, my my mother's um, half Swiss French, so I was taught it as a child, uh, and then I lived in France for some of my education. Uh, so yeah, that that's that's <laughs> that's why I've been I've been lucky enough to pick it up. Oh, that's lovely. Hmm. All right, do you guys have any more questions you'd like to talk about? It doesn't have to be pronunciation. And Sebastian says, we're butchering the pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. If you guys have anything else you want to talk about, please put it in the chat right now. Um, Kyle says, I, I agree. Omega. Mm. So, that's what I say mm. here in Utah. But uh, while we wait for any other questions mm. here, I just want to thank you, Armand, for taking some time. I know it's getting late over there in Oxford. This has been awesome <laughs> to meet you. It's you been know, a great put a pleasure. Face. Yeah. You know, I, I really... I enjoy your content. The fact that you're so young and you're passionate and you're knowledgeable mm. and you're, you're doing YouTube and a blog and a podcast. Mm. Uh, that's impressive. It's, it's really great to see that. And I'm happy for your success and guys here, definitely check out Armand. If you haven't come across his channel before or his podcast, I'll make sure there's links in the description. Definitely support him. Uh, you know, he's full time doing this. So that, I mean, that's mm. a big thing. Uh, thank you, Armand, for coming on today. This has been great. And you're no, thank you. Thank you very much. Definitely welcome to come back anytime in the future. I, I try to stream, you know, once once a week. Um, mm. So maybe, I don't know, maybe later on in the year we can have a follow-up yeah. discussion. That'd be fun. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'm sure we're gonna see some uh, some interesting releases before before too long. So I'm sure by later in the year um we'll have plenty to talk about. And if I if Ooh. I if I do some live streams, you'll be certain to be uh, uh to be on the guest list. Oh yeah, that'd be great. Hey, yeah. you know what? Um Real quick, I probably shouldn't share this, so of course I'm going to do it. But yeah. I have a source that shared with me a few pictures. I don't have them. I'm not yeah. going to post them. Yeah. I'm not going to name my source. <laughs> but I do know that there's going to be some pretty cool Brightling releases coming out that will surprise mm. us. We're going to see a triple bait. We're going to see a turbion. Right. We're going to see some really cool mm. stuff. Moon phase. Stuff that we haven't seen from Brightling in a long, mm. long time. Um, Brightling have been on fire over the last few few months. Yeah, they've been putting out some really cool stuff, really and they've cool been stuff. rising in market share too. I, I, see, I yeah. saw the Swiss exports every year. Slowly, they've been uh, they've been raising. I, I think that's great to see. I, I'm a fan mm. of, of what Brightling's been doing. Yeah, it's kind of awkward for me because um, one of my and this is complete chance. Um, a uh, an ex um, school friend of mine is, I think, the nephew of the former. Um, CEO of Brightling. Oh, really? Um, uh, and uh, and so it's always a bit a bit awkward when you sort of see the the kind of improvement we've seen. To be quite honest, since, yeah. since it's changed hands. <laughs> well, that's a good thing, though. But you know, yeah, we need these things. All right, here's a question from Wilson. Where do you see yourself in the watch media world in the next five to ten years? That's an interesting question. Um, it's a it's a complicated one because. I do intend to, I, pro I probably will drop back to part-time for a number of reasons, partly because I'd like to continue my studies. Oh, really? um, just, just to have some, uh, uh, just to have sort of some further knowledge because I came straight out of school and went straight into running this. And uh, yeah. I feel like I could be a, a better journalist, a better, uh, someone who's better qualified to talk about these watches. Maybe, maybe I'll, pro I'll probably stay on YouTube. Um, I'm sure YouTube will be, if ever anything were to go from my contribution to watch media, it would be, uh, the last thing would be YouTube. Okay. Because it's just, it was the first, the place I started and it's the place I feel most comfortable. But um, I I'd love to start writing for some other publications. Uh, that's something I'd really love to do. Um, but, uh, but for the time being, I don't, I don't know where I see myself in five to 10 years. Uh, I see myself either remaining uh, or going, either going part-time um, in order to have a little bit more freedom as well to be able to say what I like uh -huh. because I think that's important too you know when you're when you're full time you do worry about burning your boats a bit with certain individuals and brands uh, which is you know which is neither here nor there but it's nice to be able to speak your mind and still be factual I don't mean insulting I just mean you know to be, to be frank about something um, 
Oh, but I've maybe say, maybe writing. writing I, I hope to hear more like cripplingly ugly phrases. <laughs> I'll do my you. best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's great. Um, let's do maybe one more here. Let's talk mm. about the Breitling subscription model. Uh, someone asked ah. what they thought about that. Mm. Here it is. Thoughts on the Breitling Select program. Have you mm. seen that, Arm Armand? Yeah, I I've taken a brief look. I haven't looked into it too much, but it's a it's a, an interesting idea. It's the idea, isn't it, that you get you try watches on like three per year, and then you decide which one you want to buy at the end. Yeah, well, you don't even have to buy one. You can just send it back oh, right. at the end if you decide you don't like their price or something. Yeah, I looked into it because I like the idea. We're always, uh, at least, I flip watches all the time. I'm always cycling through watches um, mm -hmm. just for the experience. And so I, I, I looked into it. You spend 450 yeah. to start and then you pay, I think it's 120 a month. I, I can't remember mm -hmm. the exact figure. You just pay to Breitling every month and you get to pick three watches or up to three watches to enjoy for one year. I think right. if you pick one and you just love that, I think you can just keep that for the mm -hmm. duration of the year. And then you have the opportunity to buy it uh, outright at the end of the period, if you want to, or you can send mm. it back to them. They refurbish it. Um, yeah. They give you a new strap and then they send it to the next person in the program. Nice. So it ends up being around $2,000 a year to try up to three watches with the ability to purchase mm. at the end of that term. So mm. I think it's interesting. Um, personally, mm. I don't know. I think it's a good way for Breitling to get people in interested in their brand that might be new to the luxury side, because I mean, yeah. we've all been there. You talked about your tutor experience. I've yeah. been there before where I'm like, man, this is a lot of money to spend on one watch. And so I think for the first time it, it, it would be easier to say, Hey, this is a way I can get into luxury and I'm only spending 450. And then, excuse me, you can probably hear my dogs. I think we have somebody at the door. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> it's worry. an easy, it's an easier way to to get into a luxury watch without you know spending four or five thousand dollars on sure. a Breitling outright. So I think it's a good way to get people in to the hobby. But for those that have had experience at the luxury level, I don't necessarily think it's going to be appealing uh, mm. as a watch enthusiast. So that's what I think. I don't know. Do you have any other mm. thoughts, Armand, about this? It, it's it's a tough one because I think that your watch you have to be going for something of a fa well fairly high up in the Breitling collection in my opinion for it to make sense um, to have that amount of money spent. I'm sorry, you can probably oh, hear my girls. <laughs> no, no, don't, don't, don't worry. I mean, I'm uh, doing this in my in my dining room, and the neighbours are noisy, so it doesn't. You know, <laughs> no, no worries. We, we, you know, this is the way everywhere. But um, yeah, I'd say that I would probably want to go for something in house in that kind of price or above to, to go for that. Otherwise I would probably just buy it Makes full sense. price. And, and, and then, you know, within the first week or so, I think I'll probably know whether I want to keep it or not. Yeah. Uh, it makes sense. You know, if you make that emotional connection yeah, or not. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes you're just left cold by an amazing watch. Yeah. Well, I better go attend to whatever's going on out there. Thank you again, Armand, for coming on. This has been great to talk to you, get to know you a little bit. Uh, you've been very gracious with your time, and uh, I appreciate this very much. So thank you for coming on today. No, thank you very much for having me. It's uh, It's been a great pleasure, and I hope we get the chance to do it again. Yeah, you bet. We'll do it later this year. Brilliant. That'd be great. All Brilliant. right, guys, well, we're signing you. off now. Thank you for watching today, and we'll we'll see you next time. Thank you.